So I'm going to discuss them in a different order in which you saw them, so hopefully that won't be confusing. I'm going to start and just say a couple things about uh, what I'm going to call the China paper, and then I'm going to talk about the art paper and the mortgage paper. So reading China, predicting policy change with machine learning. So the research question I think they, uh, they come at is, can we predict, as they said, policy changes in China? And if you think about that, the first way you would do that is say, well, can we predict what the policy is going to be now and compare that to what policy was and we've identified a change? And the answer is no, that's really hard to do to try to predict what the policy may be. So then they said, well, we know that new policies are um, led by sort of propaganda around that policy in the newspaper. And so if we can predict the content of the newspaper, we can then identify new policies. But it turns out it's also really hard to predict what's going to be in the newspaper. So instead, they come up with this very clever trick, which is let's not predict what's going to be on the front page. Let's t take every article that appears and predict whether the article goes on the front page. So we're not predicting the content of the front page. We're taking the content and predicting the page. And what they do with that prediction, that prediction is not the prediction of a policy change, but rather what they do is essentially they say, we'll build this algorithm that can predict for every article in your quarter S whether it appears, it should appear, or it appears on the front page. Then what we're going to do is we're going to deploy this algorithm for articles that appear in the same quarter, or sort of the, the ending quarter of the five years of articles we built it for. And then we're going to use that same algorithm to look at articles in the next quarter. And then we're essentially going to calculate the difference in the performance of the algorithm in the two periods. And if the algorithm does just as good a job predicting the front page in the period in which it's trained on and in the subsequent period, then nothing's really changed. But if the performance of the algorithm has changed, then what it means is that the algorithm was surprised that it found something. What was on the front page is not what it would have classified to be on the front page, suggesting a change in the direction that the newspaper was taking. And so that's what the paper does. The comments I want to offer here is there's something different here. There's something interesting. The machine learning itself isn't doing the prediction. The prediction is, I predict something is going to happen because my algorithm that used to perform well is starting to perform poorly. And I think that's just something interesting for us to think about. What they've done is developed an empirical strategy using machine learning to identify what I say kind of when has the world changed, right? So when a well-performing algorithm starts getting its predictions wrong, we should infer from that that the world as the algorithm understands it has changed. And that's, I think, a neat addition to our Economist Toolkit. The question I have for the authors is, is they give a few sort of additional applications, but those applications all look like their applications, largely focused on sort of propaganda um, in, in communist countries. I guess the question I ask is, what are the types of things that could change that we don't know and where it would be useful to try to infer it from using this type of methodology of calculating the surprise to a previously well-functioning um, or, or, or well-predicting well algorithm. And so I leave that as sort of my comment for them is to make this more broadly useful to economists, providing more guidance on other types of scenarios where this type of surprise to the algorithm could be useful to answer economic questions would be really useful. And so with that, I want to turn to the other two papers. So I want to talk first about the art paper, which is the last one we saw. So the research question here, I, I'm going to sort of take it up a level from what the, the author presented. The, the question at a high level is what happens when we replace a primitive prediction technology with a more sophisticated machine learning based one? In this case, the primitive prediction technology uh, is the auction house expert. Their setting, is, as you saw, was art auctions. Every auction house has an expert who forms a high and a low estimate of what a painting will sell for. That's their prediction. This prediction is shared with the bidders, and then the auction takes place. They have data on over a million paintings from a few hundred auction houses, and they're going to compare four prediction technologies. He didn't talk about the hedonic regression, but they compare the human, the hedonic, the machine learning model without the image of the painting, and the machine learning model with the image. And the key findings, I'll go through quickly because he, he summarized them well. Number one, perhaps a little bit surprisingly, the human expert does a better job than the machine. Um, 
the machine does a be, the, the machine learning model does a much better job than the hedonic model, which is probably why they didn't even talk about it. Second, the machine learning prediction, despite not being as good as the human, still adds value um, after controlling for the human prediction. Putting the machine learning prediction in there still improves the regression, as you saw. That suggests the machine picks up something that the human doesn't. Third, the machine prediction is particularly useful or adds explanatory power in these two settings that he highlighted at the end with artists who have had more variability in the price of their paintings recently and artists who have had low returns in recent past. And finally, what's interesting, the machine learning can predict whether a painting will be under or over estimated by auction houses. So that suggests that the human expert's mistakes here are systematic, that the machine can pick those up. So now I'm going to talk about the second one and then put comments together. So the second paper, to some degree, has the exact same question, uh, which is what happens when we replace a primitive prediction technology with a more sophisticated one? Here they're being more specific. What happens to credit market outcomes when we do this? And in particular, do the changes in outcomes occur differentially across uh, different race groups? The setting is the market for mortgages. What's the prediction here, of course? Lenders are predicting the probability of default on a loan, which influences their decision whether to offer a loan and at what interest rate. We talked about the data. And the prediction technologies compared are a logit with, with linear variables, a logit where the variables enter in bins non-linearly, and a machine learning model. There's three steps to the paper, and it's just worth highlighting them if you haven't read them, because it's really quite a, a nice, complete treatment. The paper starts with a simple model that just gives the intuition of why the machine learning model could generate differences across race groups, the triangulation argument and the flexibility argument. The paper then carries out the, the empirical exercise of going through predicting a given borrower's uh, probability of default with the different technologies and seeing how the predictions differ. And then the last part, uh, is they embed those predictions in an equilibrium model of competition between lenders so that they can say something not just about how your predicted default changes, but what are the resulting equilibrium effects on who gets loans and at what interest rate. And the findings, I'll go through quickly again. The, the presentation, I think, was, was very nice. The machine learning models improve the accuracy of predictions here. But the machine learning models lead to winners and losers. They didn't use this term in the presentation, but I think it's the easiest way to think about it. What does it mean to be a winner from the machine learning model here? It means I'm predicted to have a lower probability of default than I was before. So I've won because I'm a better risk now, under the, or I'm predicted to be a better risk. Losers are the opposite. And what that nice picture that he showed shows that black and Hispanic borrowers are the least likely to be winners from the new technology. And then when you run this through the equilibrium model, they find that overall, more, more people are offered mortgages, um, and even more so in, uh, among black borrowers. But white and Asian borrowers are more likely to receive lower interest rates. And the within group and cross group dispersion of interest rates increases. OK, so a couple of comments on these two papers, which I think are a nice package. So much of the attention around AI and even at the conference today is focused on those places where we think AI is going to replace our jobs, right? What are the tasks and jobs that are going to be changed or replaced by AI? And I think of these as the jobs that don't look right now like prediction problems, but now that AI is getting so sophisticated, the job has become a prediction problem, right? The radiologists, the truck drivers, the customer service agents. But probably the most immediate applications of machine learning should be existing prediction problems that look just like prediction problems that we're currently using a primitive prediction technology for, and where we can probably pretty easily just substitute machine learning as a better prediction uh, technology. And so those two papers give us two examples, setting estimates for art auctions. You could think analogously about setting list prices for homes, predicting credit worthiness, I think fairly analogous would be um, predicting risk for insurance, predicting fraudulent transactions, or for firms forecasting you know, sales or inventories or, or hiring needs. All of these are things that are, have always been prediction problems, and now we just have a better prediction technology. And so in these scenarios, machine learning integrates into existing jobs, into existing work, workflows, so we should expect to see adoption there 
And so I think it makes sense for us as economists to be thinking uh, about the effects of these. And, and maybe we don't need to because it feels like, oh, not much is going to happen. It's just sort of the same thing a little bit better. But I think in particular what the, the mortgage paper shows us is actually things might happen. And so how do we think about approaching this type of question? What happens when a primitive prediction technology is replaced with a more sophisticated one? There's sort of five steps to think about. First, the firm chooses the new, whichever prediction technology. Then it predicts whatever it is it needs to predict. The firm then makes some decision based on that prediction. It's an input to the decision. Then stuff happens, right? Then other agents make decisions. Their competitors make decisions, or the, the borrowers decide whether to accept the loan, or whatever else happens. And equilibrium outcomes and payoffs are realized. And so, you know, on one hand, you might think that the, if we're going to answer this question, sort of what happens when we replace a primitive prediction technology with a more sophisticated one, the most straightforward empirical approach would be to get data on adoption of the new technology, find some variation there related to equilibrium outcomes, and write a straightforward paper. Now, that's not what these guys do. There's nothing wrong with the fact that that's not what they do. I imagine they just don't have that data. But in a sense, in our minds, that's what we're trying. We're, we're trying to understand this link. And these papers, these last two, or the last, these two papers, are sort of operating at different port points along here. So what these papers are doing instead is not directly relating those things. They're saying, we have the data these firms have. And so we're going to apply machine learning for them to the prediction problem they have. We'll do the prediction with the different prediction technologies and figure out what happens. And I don't know, it would be interesting for you guys to speak to whether they are being used in the way that you use it in the paper or not. And so if we look at where they line up here, the art paper, machine learning, human experts, et cetera, in a sense, starts and finishes in this section. And I think my biggest criticism um, and, and comment to this paper is in some sense, you're, only, you're not really answering the question that we can, you know, if we go back a slide, don't do that actually. Seems to. If, we, if we care about the relationship from here to here, you're stopping here. You're basically telling us how the prediction has changed. On the other hand, the credit market paper starts here by telling us how the predictions change, but then embeds it in a model of these parts so we can tell us how things end up here. And I wanted to, I think that difference is really important because I want to encourage the authors of the R paper to try to do the same. So if we think about as economists this question, you know, what, how does the adoption of machine learning as a replacement prediction technology matter? And we say, where should we focus? I would argue we shouldn't focus here. I mean, there needs to be a difference here for there to be a difference here. But this seems like something the statistician should be figuring out, horse racing these different technologies. Where our comparative advantage would be, it seems to me, is over here, right? Once we figure out how the prediction changes, then what are the non-obvious effects on equilibrium outcomes that maybe we didn't think would result because it feels like we're just slotting in a new prediction technology. And as we're starting to see, as we can see in the paper that takes it all the way to equilibrium outcomes, there can be a whole range of effects that maybe we wouldn't have um, anticipated. And then ultimately, if we can think about kind of what happens here, we then should also be able to think back to who's going to adopt the prediction technology and who will adopt it first and where will it be, you know, where, where will it be adopted first. And so my, my concluding comments, you know, our comparative advantage as economists approaching this question, I don't think is in horse racing different prediction technologies. I think we're good at thinking about decision making and the equilibrium outcomes that result from those decisions. And therefore, it seems to me where we should be focusing is on these types of questions. You know, when will upgrading a prediction technology generate changes in equilibrium outcomes and what are the welfare implications of these changes? And so I'd push you in your paper to say, look, what would happen if the auction house were to either replace the humans with the machine learning or augment it, right? What would be different, right? So which paintings would sell that wouldn't have sold otherwise? Which artists would make more money who weren't otherwise making money? Which paintings would not sell that otherwise would have? Unless you can tell us sort of some outcome is going to be different, I'm not sure why we care that the predictions themselves are different. And I think there will be differences. But in order to make, I think, an economically interesting paper, we need to see that. 
The other types of questions, I think, are things like what factors influence how the new technology impacts outcomes. So if we go all the way to where you did down to the equilibrium model, now we can start thinking about different assumptions about the model you took if the, if the you know, in your case, the lenders were symmetric, right? So what happens if the lenders are not identical? What happens if the lenders don't both have access to an equally good prediction technology? What if one of the lenders has a great AI and another one has a mediocre AI. How does that change? And what I didn't find, and maybe I missed it, is what happens to the profits, the profitability of, of mortgages to these two firms. Uh, and that's sort of just what I haven't read, is just pushing you to help, since you've gone almost all that way, to help us think about you know, what market conditions would change your findings. I think that's it. OK, thank you.